So we're going to talk about today is, you would think, something that would be very easy and very simple. I want to get prints that match what I see on my monitor. And that is probably one of the most frustrating things I've heard talk, people talk about. So we're going to make that happen. In fact, even this morning, uh, I just got a new paper in that was really exciting. I wanted to see how well it was going to perform. So I created a custom profile for it. I printed out the prints, and they are stunning. And uh, we'll talk about how that happens and how it happens every time if you just follow these steps. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joe Brady. I am one of X-Rite's Colorado. I'm also one of Sony's Artisans of Imagery team. So, as I mentioned, this is really frustrating. Why don't my prints match my monitor? I hear this all the time, particularly from uh, the wedding portrait folks. And we're going to talk about why this happens and see, first of all, the source of the problems. And we're going to eliminate them right from the get-go. Now first, let's just talk about what happens with your images. You're starting with a raw file, I hope. Remember, JPEGs are very limited. If you're shooting JPEGs, you have to be really careful. Now, perfectly exposed JPEG is a wonderful file, but if they're slightly off, then you have much less latitude for editing that image. Remember that when you're dealing with a raw file, the only information in that file is three numbers, red, green, and blue for each pixel. There's no color space assigned. There's no white balance assigned. When you bring those images into software, the software by default will use whatever your camera was set for as a starting point, but none of this has been decided yet. So the software then has to render that image up to the screen. This is all done through a series of profiles, and you have to make sure this stuff is set up correctly to make sure that happens. What this is going to do is it's going to allow you to get accurate and consistent prints all the time. It's going to save you a lot of time because you're going to get that print right the first time, and you're not going to waste paper and ink. As much as I love printing, Paper and ink is expensive. It's the printers they're pretty much given away, and then you have to go load them up with ink, and that's where you spend the money. So before you do anything, your monitor has to be under control. You've got to get it as good as it can be, because this is where you're making all your editing decisions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there's two words that are used for this, calibration and profiling. What calibration does is it sets up the monitor sort of a, to a default set of specifications. It sets the brightness, it sets a color temperature, and it sets the contrast curve. The profiling is where the colors are corrected for after the calibration part is taken, taken care of. And again, think about it. You're making your, Im your image adjustments based on what you see on the screen. Well, if the screen is off, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to be guessing. You really have no idea what you're doing to the image. And let's take a look and see why this happens. Now, most monitors out of the box have a tendency to be a little too bright and a little too blue. Well, why is this? Well, think about what you do with your computers nowadays. You're watching videos, you're playing games, you're on YouTube, you're cruising the web, you're doing word processing, and oh, every once in a while, you're actually editing an image. Well, color, color settings for watching videos and playing games is not really conducive to image editing. And here's why. So for example, let's say you have a monitor that is too bright and too blue. So you have your image up on the screen and you decide, well, it's too blue, I need to add some yellow to it. <coughs> so you add some yellow to the image, oh, now it looks great on the screen. But what happens when you go out to print? You get a really yellow image. Why is this? Because you're correcting for the blueness that's on the screen, not that's actually in the image data file. So you're trying to correct something that isn't really in the data. The other common problem is monitors are too bright. Again, looks great on movies and games, not good for image editing. So you've got your image on the screen, looks good, a little too bright. So you create an adjustment in software to get it just where you want it. Then you send it out to print and what happens, and this is probably the most common thing I hear, you get back dark prints. Why? Well, really, it's mostly because your monitor is simply too bright. Oh, a couple of questions that are coming through, uh, just so you know. Uh, if you can't see the screen, you might want to exit the system and come back in. And also someone asked if there's going to be a live presentation, meaning video at any point. In this case, in today's uh, presentation, the answer is no. This is just going to be me on the screen. Uh, and also there was a question about, can you calibrate IMAX with a retina display? And the answer is yes. So let's we'll get into calibration in just a little bit. So we see the problems 
too blue, too bright, you need to calibrate to make sure your monitor is displaying color to the best of its ability. Now, I'm not going to do a full demo of this. I just kind of want to give you a taste of it because watching some of the calibration happen isn't that exciting to watch, but I want to show you how the Color Monkey Photo software works. And this is the device we're using today. The reason for that is this is a device that can not only calibrate and profile your monitor, but it will allow us to create a custom paper profile for our printer, which is going to give us the best results possible. And again, you can do this on pretty much any display. Really, it doesn't matter what the monitor is. You could even, I don't know if any of you still have old CRTs, but can you calibrate a CRT? Sure. What this device is doing is simply measuring the color that's sent up to the screen and comparing it against a known standard. So when the software says, oh, here's 100% red, the device is simply going to read it. I don't know why my screen just jumped there, but okay. We're actually going to go into the Color Monkey Photo software. So let's head over into that. And let me hide the other stuff so we have a nice clean screen to work with. And let's start from the home screen. Okay, so here's the start of the software. And again, I'm not going to do a full demo. I just want to show you the high points. You have a couple of big buttons here. And the first one says, match my printer to my display. Let me make one thing clear. Your printer doesn't even know you have a display or vice versa. What the software is going to do is make your display as accurate as possible. It's going to make your printer paper combination as accurate as possible. And when they're all accurate, they match. That's really simply what happens. So let's go through the process. So I'm going to click on this match my printer to my display. And the first thing it asks you, what are you doing? Is it an LCD or LED or retina? You choose that one. Is it a laptop, which is what I'm talking to you on right now? Or is it a projector? Now you have a choice of easy or advanced. Easy is just going to do everything for you. Advanced, you get the option to make a couple of changes. And I, I would recommend staying on easy, but there's a couple of things I want you to know about. First of all is the white point of your display. Notice it says D65, which is recommended. There are some people out there, and there are very few, but there's one lab in particular that recommends you set your monitor at D50. And the real answer is they're wrong. Most monitors have a native white point of D65. Go with it. Also, your brightness setting. Now, if you click on here, you see this number. It's candelas per meter squared, if you care. And it goes from 80 up to 140 in the native. My recommendation to you personally is never go above 120 because if you go above that in brightness, your shadows are going to lighten up. You might see more detail than is really there, or it's going to look like you've seen more detail. And when you go out to print, it's going to be dark. Dimmer is better. If you're working in a dim room, then set it for 80. If you have to compromise, I find it a good number for a laptop is around 100. If you're in, say, working in a cubicle environment and it's a, or it's a bright room, then 120 is a compromise. Since I'm on my laptop, I'll just set it for 100. So then you click on Next, and you're directed to hang the Color Monkey on the screen. And again, I'll, I'll start it off, and then I'm going to stop it. So the Color Monkey has a little pouch, and it's got a weighted strap on it. You just hang it on your screen. You click Next. And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to measure the brightness of the screen and perhaps ask you to make an adjustment. And while this is happening, by the way, uh, Steve asks, is this going to be recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. And when the follow-up email is sent to you guys, it will have a link to the recording so you can uh, watch it at your leisure. Uh, also, uh, Richard asks, he purchased a Color Monkey a few years ago. Has the software been updated? Yes, it has. Uh, it was actually updated last year, and it works fine. I am on the latest OS, and everything works great. Okay, so you see here this kind of little... Uh, control panel that says what the brightness is. Now I'm working on a laptop and the brightness up and down buttons are usually pretty big jumps. My target was 100. Let's see if I bring it down one, what it drops it down to. Oh, don't tell me I hit 100. All right, 96. Fine. If you're within this green, that's great. Just get as close as you can. Then you click on next. And this is the part I'm going to stop because you don't want to sit for five minutes watching colors appear on my screen. But what it's doing is it's sending known values up to the screen. So for example, when it gets to 100% red, the device will read it in and it will see what really showed up. Let's say for argument's sake that the red had, oh, three points of blue in it. Well, a profile is basically a set of corrections. 
So it records that information and makes a correction for it. So the next time your software is sending an image up to the screen, if there is a part of it that's 100% red, that goes through the profile and the profile says, hey, if you really want 100% red on the screen, you got to take out three points of blue. That's really kind of as simple as it is. So rather than wait the five minutes, we're just going to stop this here because I had already profiled it earlier. And we'll assume that's done. When it's done, it asks you to give a name for the profile and it gives you the option to uh, have that uh, a reminder that it's time to profile again. Okay, so let's get back to our screen. All right, so we'll assume that the, the display is now profiled. Let's go to the printer. And I'm going to choose the printer. I've got an Epson P600 here. And I, this new paper I just got uh, is made by Canson. Uh, I've tested the Epson papers and the profiles, the factory profiles from Epson are pretty darn good for most of their papers. Where you really benefit from having a custom profile is when you're dealing with fine art papers. So let me go ahead and put a name here. This is Canson Aquarelle. It's a very heavy watercolor paper that is beautiful. And you click on next and it's going to tell me to print out this chart. Uh, I'm going to bypass this for now because I just want to show you a couple of things. Let's get back into this. Okay, so we saw the startup screen. Here's where you would give the name to the uh, profile. So let's talk about the paper profiles a little bit. We know the monitor is now showing correct colors to the best of its ability. What does a custom paper profile do? The problem is factory profiles may or may not be that accurate. And what a custom profile is, it's an exact picture of how your printer puts ink on a paper. And this is going to become really important when we get into the soft proofing process into the software. So I'm going to show you how to create a, a custom paper profile. And then we're going to take a look at it and we're going to compare it to the factory profile. And then we're going to put it to use in both Lightroom and Photoshop. All right, so here we go. So back to the screen. Okay, so let's go ahead and create our profile and then we will uh, come back and compare it. Okay, so it says go ahead and print this target. So just like when we did our monitor, the target has a bunch of colors that uh, are known values. And we're going to read them in just like when it read the colors off the monitor. Now to save time, I already printed my target. So I'm going to click next and it tells me to start reading it in. And the color monkey has a big button on the side of it. And you simply click on it. In fact, there is a little video animation that I can click on here and it shows you what to do. And one important note is when you start reading, make sure you start on white paper. Don't actually start on the color and you click the play here. It says push in the side, you drag it a little cross. When you get to the end, it will then direct you to move on to the next row. That's really as simple as it is. So we'll stop that. And I actually have my print right in front of me. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I just click and drag across and it says great that was a good reading for the first row and you can actually do this pretty quickly you can go faster than the dude did on the animation by the way if you vary like if you wander off the row and uh, it picks up some of the other color which I just did it will give you a little red flash and say no you need to do that row again so just be careful and watch it and just read it in so this first chart is actually 50 patches and it's very fast to read. There, I just read in the 50 patches. Then you click next. And what the software is going to do is it's going to generate a second chart based on adjustments created from the reading into the first chart. By doing it this way, by doing this two steps and taking the data from the first chart, it creates a much more accurate profile than if you just read in 100 patches. Uh, it's taking that data and applying it, and that does give you a lot more uh, accuracy. Uh, let's see couple questions. Let me just, while this is doing its generating thing, a uh, couple of you are asking about software, so that's not a problem. Uh, 
And then Kevin's asking about using RIP software, uh, kind of a subject for another day. If you're getting into RIPs, if you don't know what a RIP is, guess what? You don't need one. Uh, if you are using a RIP, then maybe send me an email. I'll give you guys my email address at the end uh, if you have something that's a little more advanced. Uh, Jack asks, do you, if you have an older color monkey, do you have to buy a new one? I have some color monkey photos that I've had for about seven years, I think. And I just updated the software uh, to the newest version and they work just lovely. Uh, Chris asks also, do ink changes make a difference? Uh, if you're using the factory inks and you're just replacing cartridges, then no, they really don't. They're very consistent from, from batch to batch. Okay, so it's calculated the second chart and it tells you go ahead and do the next one. And also make sure that your print settings match the paper. So for example, if you're printing matte paper, make sure that's the setting you have so that the colors are going to be put down correctly. You want to make sure that the settings you print these charts on are going to be the same settings you use when you actually do the print. All right, so it tells me print. I can say, well, for example, here's my printer. I can go to printer settings. I've got matte paper. I'm printing on photo. Lovely. So I would just click on print. And I don't even actually have my printer hooked up right now. I can just hit next. And also, you'll see this after each print is done. It asks you to wait for 10 minutes because you want the print to dry. Inks typically will darken and harden over the first 10 minutes. And you want to get a really accurate reading. So just let them sit for 10 minutes and then you can come back. You can also do this at any time. You can also do them in batches. So if you wanted to profile, so say, three different papers at the same time, you could actually... Uh, do that. You can print out several from the first charts and then come back. So I, again, I have my prints already done. I will skip the drawing process and go ahead and read in the next chart just like the first one. So again, I just click and drag across the row and if it's successful, it moves on to the next. And again, you can see how fast this is to do. There's no measuring individual patches. You just click and drag and then let, let go and that's it. Give it a name and I'll call it, uh, I'm going to call it a little different because I already have one in here. And also, and again, this is my personal preference and you'll see why. I like to add CMP, Color Monkey Photo, to the name of my profiles because that just cues me in that these are profiles that I've created. Then I click on Save and it'll go ahead and create the profile. It says it might take a couple of minutes. Let me check to see if there's any questions while we're doing this. Let's see. Um, let's see. Someone asked about outs if you're printing out to an outside lab. Uh, you don't. You're generally not going to profile to an outside lab. Some labs will provide a profile for you, but in general, that is not necessary. Uh, there is a video online if you go on x right Photo or on my website. It's there that talks about getting prints back from your lab. Uh, in that case, you're not going to create a custom printer profile. What you're going to do is create a calibrated sRGB profile. Slightly different uh, subject than today, so go ahead and watch the video. Uh, oh, Jan uh, uh, mentions, uh, or Jan, I'm not sure where you're from. Uh, some papers... Uh, Manufacturers recommend drying for 24 hours. Uh, I did I did test that. I have had some fine art papers where they recommended let it get sit for 24 hours. And when I did the profiles, uh, I wasn't able to see any difference between the 10 minute and the 24 hour drying time. Uh, certainly you want to let them sit 24 hours before mounting them or putting them behind glass because they will outgas some vapor. And if you put them in a frame, uh, it's going to fog the, frog the glass on the inside. But as far as profiling goes, I haven't been able to see any difference. All right, so our profile is done. Uh, you are given the option to have all of these applications automatically use this profile as a default. Uh, since I use a lot of different papers, I choose not to do this. But it is an option if you always print on the same paper. So then we click on Finish. And guess what? We're done. Uh, we're done with the software. We now have an accurately profiled monitor. We have a custom profile for our paper. So we can actually quit the Color Monkey Photo software. We're done with that. And now we've got, since we've got our profile created, let's take a look and compare it to the factory one. And to do that, on the Mac, there's a utility called the Color Sync Utility. 
All right, so I have all these profiles. I've got the ones from the system, the ones in the computer. Here's the factory profiles, and here's profiles that I've created. So I mentioned I'm using this Canson paper. So here's the Canson download for their Aquarelle paper. And as I spin it around, you can see this is the color space of this particular paper on this printer. By itself doesn't tell you a whole lot other than it does go almost to a pure black, which is pretty exciting for a fine art paper. In the past, uh, they didn't have this much density down below. But still by itself doesn't tell us that much. Let's compare it to the one that we just created. So I click on hold for comparison. And if you look under user, you can see down here, I've got the CMP. These are the Color Monkey Photo ones that I created. Here's the one I was using for my prints. So when I overlay that, now what happens is I get to see in color the custom profile that I created, and that white ghosted outline is the factory profile. You can see in most cases they match pretty closely. However, there's one, weak, one slight weakness on this profile. See all this white out here on the one side? This paper profile is saying that I can print more deep light blues, this kind of cyan color, and also dark blue over here, then in reality I can actually print. The custom profile shows me exactly what my printer paper combination is capable of doing. Now the danger in this is when you have to use a rendering intent and soft proofing, and we'll see this in software in just a minute. When the software goes to remap the colors, if it tries to map a color into here, into this area, say, uh, that area can't be printed, and when it goes to print, it's actually going to push them further over into this printable space. So you're not having the best control, uh, especially for fine gradations. So that this is the advantage of having a custom paper profile. As good as this factory one is, you can see it's still not perfect. Now I've got a perfect picture, and that's going to provide the best results every time. All right, so the next step is soft proofing. Now, what is soft proofing? Soft proofing is a way to actually see on your monitor how your print's going to print before you actually print. Uh, that was a lot of word print. But what it really does is it's, this is the part that really saves you both time and money because you're going to get a print that looks like your screen the first time out. Now, do understand that a print is obviously created with color differently than an image on your screen. On an image on your screen, you've got a backlit RGB. On your paper, you've got CMYK inks going on paper that are going to be affected by whatever light it is that you're looking at the print under. Soft proofing assumes you are looking at your print under daylight lights. So the choices are, well, you can either go outside and look at it or really, really inexpensive way to do it is buy yourself a couple of... Uh, Daylight full spectrum light fixtures. Uh, I picked a couple of lows at a couple up at Lowe's and they were 39 bucks a piece. They're full spectrum daylight balanced lights. I have one right over my printer and I have one on my editing table. So when I put my prints down after they're dried, I can look at them and I can see that they really match my screen very closely. Before we get into soft proofing, it is important that you understand this whole rendering intense thing. So let's take a look at that. Now, what is a rendering intent? Well, a rendering intent takes colors that are out of gamut, meaning you're going to have images, colors in your image that your printer just can't print. Typically, you're going to find super saturated and particularly dark colors just aren't going to translate well onto paper, uh, particularly on a fine art paper. You, you're used to seeing they're not quite as dense and shiny as a glossy stock is. So there's certain colors that have to be moved into a printable space. That's what it, the in gamut means. Now there's two choices for photography, relative color metric and perceptual. And by the way, if you have no color out of gamut, let's say it was kind of a cloudy, foggy day and there aren't any really bright colors, then it's not gonna matter which one you choose. But let's see our two main rendering intents. Let's take a look at perceptual first. So what rendering intents do again is they take color out of gamut and move it back in. And the different rendering intents do this differently. So in this diagram, let's imagine inside the black circle are all the colors that can be printed on this paper printer combination. These colors out here are out of gamut. That means they can't be printed correctly, they have to be moved. So perceptual rendering will take these colors and move them into a color into the printable color space. It will also take the colors that were in the way and move them so that the relationship between these out of gamut colors and the in gamut colors stays the same. So you end up with something like this. 
The good part of this is that if you have a lot of color out of gamut, the conversion seems very natural. The downside is you can have just a few pixels out of gamut and it will cause an overall color shift in the image. And this is going to vary paper to paper, which we'll see in a minute. The other rendering intent is relative color metric. Again, same thing. It's going to take these same colors that are out of gamut and move them in. The difference is that these little dots of color that move in are going to move without any of the color that's in gamut moving. So you end up with something like this. Again, the advantage, very little color change. Uh, you're not going to see much of a shift at all. The downside could be, particularly if you have a lot of color out of gamut, you're changing the relationship of the colors from one to the other. And that can cause two things. One, artifacts. And two, imagine, let's say you've got a deep blue sky that's deep blue at the top and it goes to lighter down at the bottom. You could end up causing banding in any kind of large solid color area that has a gradation because you're disturbing the relationship of those colors. And soft proofing eliminates the guesswork out of this. You're going to get to see it on the screen. So as I mentioned, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go first into Lightroom. I'll show you how to soft proof there, and then we'll do it in Photoshop. So let's jump into Lightroom. And I've got an image here waiting. This is, uh, this is the Watchman in Zion National Park, one of my favorite spots to photograph. And we want to see how this is going to look on our paper. So if you notice, when you're in the Develop module in Lightroom, you see a button down below the image called soft proofing. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on that. And you might notice that up here on the histogram, there's some changes. Let me turn that off. So if you watch the histogram, the numbers change and you see this thing called create a proof copy. So let's do that. It's just a virtual copy. And now we can load in our paper. Now the default is going to be sRGB or Adobe RGB or whatever you're working in. Oh, by the way, uh, first of all, Lightroom always works in ProPhoto RGB behind the scenes, not something you have control over. And also there's another side in your camera. If you have that sRGB or Adobe RGB choice, that only applies to JPEGs, not to RAW. So we dial in our paper and here's our paper, our custom profile that we created. And you can immediately see that there's a change in the colors. Let's bounce back and forth between relative and perceptual and see what happens. When we go to perceptual versus relative. Notice relative is somewhat darker. Perceptual is lighter. However, it also causes a little bit more of a cyan shift up in the sky that I don't think I like. So in this case, I'm going to click on relative. I like that. Also, there's a button down here called simulate paper and ink. This is a worthless button. Let's watch what happens. This is not what the print looks like. Um, I don't, as powerful as the Adobe softwares are, this is something they haven't been able to get right, right for years. This is not what happens to the print because I happen to have the print right in front of me. And guess what? It looks just like this on the screen. So ignore this button. So you can get to choice here between your two rendering intents. And this is where you get to make your decision. While you're in here, if you see that because of the paper, there's been a shift you don't like, you have the option to come down below and make adjustments. If you want to add a little bit more contrast, maybe bring the whites down a little bit, maybe open up the shadows. You can do this, and this is specific to this particular print. What else do we want to see here? Oh, yes, one other thing. Uh, you have two other things going on here. This is a monitor gamut warning. What this is showing you is that these are the colors that the monitor can't display correctly. I'm working on an sRGB display. What it's saying is that this blue up in the sky is beyond sRGB. Uh, it would need at least an Adobe RGB monitor to see it. Nothing we can do about it. It's just a warning saying these colors are going to print slightly differently. Also, you've got a print gamut warning over here. Oh, and let's see what happens. Let's turn this on. What this is showing is these are the colors in this particular image that are at a gamut. Let's zoom in on here. I'll turn this on and off, and you can see it's this particular green that the printer can't print. It's out of gamut. And having a saturated dark color, it's not uncommon on a fine art paper. Now, you can't make it print. And again, keep in mind that you are, you are already seeing a simulation of how it will print. If you want to manually adjust it, what you can do is come down to the Use Saturation Luminance slider, again in the Develop mode, click on Saturation, click the little targeted tool here, Click on this red and drag down on the saturation for that particular color, and you'll see the red disappear. 
now you're seeing an actual perfect example of what your print is going to look like. And again, you might decide, well, gee, after I did that, I lost a little bit of pop. So you may decide, well, I want to add a little more clarity. I want to add a little more contrast. I'm going to try to bring the saturation up a little bit. And I see a little bit of that red creeping back in, but that's okay. Just understand it's not going to be quite that dense. Lovely. Now I've got a print that looks just the way I want to print it. I've got my custom paper profile. I'm choosing relative rendering intent. I'm just going to turn this off and now I'm going to go to print. Now here's one thing I wish they would fix. I already printed this this morning, so my settings were already here. But when you go to print and you choose the color management tab down here in the bottom, it doesn't necessarily remember your paper. So you have to choose your paper. By the way, if you add a new profile and the software doesn't see it, uh, Lightroom doesn't always see it. You have to go add it. So you can click on other and it will give you a list of all the papers that you have, all the profiles you have in your system, because you may not want to scroll through all of these. For example, here's the Epson Velvet Fine Art. So maybe I decide I want to add that paper. And there it is. So here's our custom profile. We chose relative. Now I click on print. Make sure you use the same settings that you used when you created your profile. And I already have those match settings saved. So we'll go out to print. And again, I don't have my printer hooked up at the moment. But a beautiful thing happens here. This is what you get. This print comes out of the printer. And I, I wish I could, there's no way I could show it to you, unfortunately. I've got it sitting right here on my desk. And believe me, it is stunning. So I hope that's clear. That's how Lightroom works. Let's take a look at how to do this in Photoshop. And Chris asked, which color space is recommended? Uh, by the way, as I mentioned, Lightroom you don't have a choice in color space. Lightroom is always working in Pro Photo RGB behind the scenes. You don't have control over that. The only time you would actually choose a color space is when you export a file. So for example, just as a side note, if we were sending this out to a lab, what we would do on our export is you would choose appropriate settings for your lab. Most labs want sRGB JPEGs at 100% quality and don't resize it. And this will give you a good print uh, going out to your, to your lab. Uh, what you could do if you wanted to soft proof is you would choose sRGB as your soft proofing. And then you can see if there's a difference between relative and perceptual. In this case, there is not. Let's jump into Photoshop and see how it is done there. So in Photoshop, I have another image for you. This is actually uh, Canera Falls in uh, uh, Canera State Park in St. George, Utah, or actually it's in Canaraville, Utah. So the soft proofing pr uh, process in Photoshop is a little more advanced and it is under view. So what you do is go to view, proof setup, custom. And notice immediately, as soon as the profile kicked in, let me turn that off, you can see a brightness change. And that's to be expected. You don't expect a, a matte watercolor paper to be as intense as a gloss stock. So again, here's our paper. Let's see what perceptual versus relative does. Relative is a little bit darker. Perceptual is a little bit more brightness. And now this becomes somewhat subjective. It's which one do you like? I actually like the brightness that perceptual adds, but I'm going to make one addition to this. By the way, some other buttons in this uh, dialog box you need to be aware of. First of all, this preserve RGB numbers, never touch that. Uh, they, they should eliminate this button or just put it in some advanced feature. There's no reason for you to ever do that. Rendering intent, notice there are four. Lightroom only has two, perceptual and relative. Saturation and absolute color metric have very specific uses that very few people ever need to know about. I also wish they would get rid of these out of Photoshop. Uh, they're there for, for commercial printing reasons. Black point compensation should be on. And once again, as in Lightroom, the simulate paper color or simulate black button, black ink buttons are worthless because that's not what the print looks like. It completely grays the thing out. It's not that bad. Uh, so I again recommend staying away from it. The print looks more like you see it here. So I decided perceptual is good. I do want to make a bit of adjustment though. Uh, let's say, for example, I want to darken up the edges a little bit. So I'm going to create a new layer. Actually, no, I'm not going to create a new layer. I'm going to create a new adjustment layer. And I'm going to go into Curves. And what I want to do, I'll just use the finger pointy thing here. I want to darken these edges up a bit. 
And I want to lighten up in here and you can see the actual buttons on the uh, slider adjust. Great. So there's my curve. I can turn that on and off and see, did it do what I want? Now it's a little too dark for my liking. So what I've already got a mask here. I'm going to get a brush, a big brush. I'm going to put it at about 60% and I'm going to take out the mask in the very middle. What I want is the edges to go darker and we kind of leave the middle alone. So now I can turn this on and off and I like that better. I've got a real dramatic print there. And what I like to do is I'll put it uh, a note here in the curve name. For, I'll call it for that particular paper so that I know I don't need this correction, say if I was going out to a gloss stock. So now once again, I've got the image the way I want. I click on print. And you do need to make sure if, if printer manages colors is chosen, by the way, then everything you've did was just a waste of time. The printer's going to take over. We are taking control of the color. Photoshop manages the colors. I do need to tell it once again, our profile. So there it is. And we did choose perceptual. We do want black point compensation. I can check the print settings one more time and see that I have my matte paper. Good. And now I click on print and once again, a beautiful thing happens. And again, I wish I could show you, but I have the print sitting right here next to me and it is stunning and it looks just like the image I have on the screen. Even though it's a matte uh, watercolor paper, uh, it is beautifully stunning result. And if you follow these steps, you're going to get prints that look like on your screen. Uh, it really is not that difficult. You need to make sure your monitor's profiled. If you have a custom paper profile, you've got everything operating optimally, the best they can be, and you're going to get images that look like you see on the screen. Let me just check a couple of questions. Let's see. Oh, good question. Uh, Richard asks, are separate profiles needed for printing done from different programs? For example, Photoshop, Lightroom, CS5, etc. And the answer to that is no. Uh, now, occasionally, there'll be a big software upgrade and the softwares will change how they deal with color. That did happen some years ago. Uh, and it created havoc and everybody had to create new profiles. But right now, pretty much everything is working fine if I use the same profiles in older versions versus newer versions of software. Uh, Harold asks, he said, you were printing at 1440, is that necessary? Is 300 DPI good enough? Uh, that's, uh, that 1440 is actually an ink density. It's actually not a DPI. It's something printer manufacturers like to throw out there because it, they like having big numbers. In fact, if you look at their greatest ink coverage, I think it's 5460 DPI, uh, again, which is just ink coverage. How much resolution do you need? Again, kind of a subject for another day, but uh, most papers can't print above 240 DPI. Uh, in fact, most matte papers can't print above 180 DPI. You need much res less resolution than you think. The default settings uh, out of all the printers is actually 240 DPI, so that should work fine. Uh, let's see, what else do we have to ask? Uh, okay. Um, oh, uh, who is asking this? Stephen asks that uh, the Color Monkey photo cannot be used to profile iOS and Android, meaning your iPads and your iPhones. That is true. The Color Monkey photo cannot do that. The Color Monkey display and the iOne Display Pro can with the XRite Color True app, but uh, doesn't work that way on with the Color Monkey photo yet. Uh, Barry asks, why is it when he does a toned black and white print, he can't get an accurate tone unless he prints in sRGB? Toning prints is a different world, but keep in mind that when you create a profile for your monitor and for your printer, it's actually going to fix black and white and tone prints as well. It's going to readjust the tone. If you create a profile for your printer, a custom profile, uh, your tone prints should also print much more closely. Uh, and uh, another question is, uh, somebody has an, uh, an IPS uh, LED monitor. Do you still have to profile your monitor as much or as often as you would with a CRT or a non-LED type monitor? That depends on the level of monitor. Uh, IPS, which means in-plane switching if you care, uh, is a single piece of a monitor. It's kind of like horsepower on a car. It doesn't make all the specifications match. You get what you pay for with monitors. And I see this all the time. If you've got some, yeah, I see photographers out there with $3,500 cameras and $2,000 lenses, 
you can't expect to do your editing on a $149 monitor you picked up at a discount store. Your monitor is a very important piece of your profiling. Uh, I use ASOS uh, in, in my workflow. I've got an ASO hooked up to my, my new iMac 27. As lovely as the new iMac screen is, it's still an sRGB display. Uh, so I like having the Adobe RGB display for doing my own imaging, my own printing. Uh, understand you get what you pay for. If you want a professional level monitor, you're going to pay about $700 and up. Uh, as far as frequency, the new monitors are much more stable over time. Uh, the default setting is to recalibrate once a month. Uh, I find on the higher end monitors, about once every three months will do it. All right, I'm just about out of time, so let's just uh, sum up. So what have we seen? I hope I made profiling your monitor simple. It really is. The software assumes you have no knowledge of any of this. Just do what it says and you're going to get a beautifully profiled monitor. And again, going back to the quality of monitor, every monitor is going to benefit from profiling, whether it be your laptop or a high-end system. It's just going to make it produce color to the best of its ability. If you have a cheap monitor, then it's just going to do to the best of its ability. A higher-end monitor is going to profile better. Same thing with your printer. If you're serious about printing, particularly if you're printing on fine art papers, having a custom paper profile is going to give you the most exact translation from what you see on the screen onto paper. And I found that creating this custom profile for this paper gave me prints that are stunning. Uh, again, I wish I could, there was a way to share them with you, but I can't. Learning how to soft proof in both Lightroom and Photoshop will let you see those decisions before you actually make a print. And once you have a profile monitor, the combination of that with soft proofing and the custom profile is going to give you a pretty darn accurate rendition on your monitor of what your print's going to look like. And that's all we want, right? Guys, so we just want to get prints that come out of the print the first time that look exactly the way we want. And that really makes printing a lot of fun. That's actually, actually it for me today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always send me an email. Uh, it's just joebrady1 at mac.com. Actually, I'll see if I can type that up on the screen for you. Uh, X-Rite will be sending a follow-up email uh, for you that will have a link to the recording, as well as a whole bunch of special offers with discount codes for the X-Rite calibration gear. So look for that. Uh, and again, I mentioned, let me just put my name up here for you. Oh, I'm just going to have to bring it up in another pair. We'll just go, we're going to do it in really basic. I'm going to do it in text edit. Here you go. If you need my email, feel free to, uh, to send me a note. It's just joebrady1 at mac.com. There you go. I'll make it bigger so you can see it a little bit. There we go. There's my email address. Happy to hear from you. Uh, I will be traveling, however, for the next uh, seven weeks. Uh, so my email access will be somewhat limited. So if I don't get back to you right away, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So thank you guys for watching. Thanks for all the great questions. Again, this has been recorded, so we will let everybody know when that is available. And again, if you have any questions, you can look on xwritephoto.com. There's a lot of great uh, videos and tutorials and links there. And you can also check out my website at joebradyphotography.com to see what's going on. So thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us and hope to see you all online again soon. Bye-bye.